I appreciate youth groups and individuals that work with young people because in my life, I've had people that have been very patient with me. Uh, I was that kid in the youth group that bugged the youth leaders all the time. Uh, you know that one kid. It's, it's, it's in every group. And if you're thinking like, we don't have that person in our group, you might be that person. <laughs> but in my rebellion, uh, in my sinful state, there were faithful individuals that continued to preach the Gospel. Uh, that continued to point me to Christ. And because of their faithfulness and the power of God's Word, uh, it bore fruit. So I'm grateful for things like this. I'm grateful for opportunities where you get to hear God's Word. Uh, and this morning, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes. This entire day, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes. Uh, you can start making your way there in your Bibles. It's going to be uh, roughly in the middle of your Old Testament. So go to the, the Psalms and then go a little further right and you'll hit Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. But as you turn there, I want us to start off by asking a question. I want to ask you a question that is somewhat connected to a hypothetical situation. And these type of questions are pretty popular nowadays. Uh, as you know, you're gearing up for the workplace. Some of you are in high school, junior high, college. Uh, you're gearing up for the workplace. A and it's popular now to ask these hypothetical scenario questions in job interviews. Airbnb, when they interview folks that are applying, ask this question. They say, what would you do if you were the only survivor in a plane crash? Dropbox asks this, if you woke up and had 2,000 unread emails and could only answer 300 of them, how do you choose which ones to answer? Bose, uh, the, the speaker company, asks this question, which I love. If you were asked to unload a Boeing 747 full of jelly beans, what would you do? I got another question for you this morning. One that I want you to truly think about. If your house, if your condo, if your apartment, if your RV, no matter where you live, if it was on fire and you could only remove one thing, what would it be? A man by the name of Foster Huntington asked himself this question. So he gathered some belongings that he would like to take to save from the fire and he took a picture of these items and he created a website where he would invite others to post their picture of what they would like to save. It's called the Burning House. And it has a ton of different pictures of what people would save if there was a fire in their house. If you could remove one thing, what would it be? The best answer for that question, if you're wise, is to say, I would remove the fire. Right? Ecclesiastes is an interesting book. Because Ecclesiastes is going to tell you and show you how to live a fixed life in a very broken world. How to have purpose in what seems like a very meaningless world. You know, you might think in your mind right now, I, I, I'm in this predicament. You know, life would be so great. My life would be perfect. My life would be fixed. If only I could have that one relationship with that individual. Or only if I could get into this school. Or if only I could get into this career. Or if only my parents would, would finally stop fighting or, or my parents wouldn't be divorced. Whatever your list of this is the thing that I would love to fix in order for my life to be right, I want to tell you that there's a better answer. The Word of God wants to tell you that there is a better answer. You don't have to remove certain things or fix certain things. You can fix the whole thing. And the way that you fix your life, the way that you find 
purpose in living this life, the way that you live a good, fixed life in a very broken world, is what Ecclesiastes will try to show us. And we start off our time together in chapter 1, looking at the first 11 verses. Uh, Solomon, uh, the, the author of this book, will introduce his thesis, uh, his, his point of writing this book. He, he will say that this is why I'm writing it in verse 2, and the rest of the, the passage from 3 to 11, he will explain to us show evidence that this idea, that this thesis is actually valid and true. Solomon will try to empirically show us that if you live in this life without God in the mix, if you don't think God exists or if God is not influential in the purpose of your life, then the, the, the conclusion that you should make about this entire life is that it is utterly pointless. It is difficult, it is annoying, it's frustrating, and there is no purpose to it whatsoever. But then he says, but guess what? Because there is God, and because you could live for Him, there can be joy and purpose and meaning in this life. Let's read the first 11 verses as we look at seven keys to living a fixed life in a broken world world seven keys to living a fixed life in a broken world ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 1 to 11 now, the words of the preacher the son of david king in jerusalem vanity of vanity says the preacher vanity of vanities all is vanity what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north and around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is never full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which is said, this, see this, is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those whom come after. Now, the first key to living a fixed life in a broken world is to realize that you need wisdom. It's to realize that you need wisdom. In verse 1, we see the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Uh, the title and the author of this book will attempt to impart wisdom. Wisdom is a good thing. We need advice. We need guidance. Uh, the, the waters of this life are tough. They're, they're difficult to navigate. And we need a compass. We need a guide. In every stage of life, you've needed help. While you were a baby, you needed your parents to aid you in surviving. Uh, it, while you were in grade school, you needed people to take care of you and teach you how to pay attention in class, what to do, what not to do. I, in middle school, you learn how to handle transitions, how to not be with the same group of people. You, you're taught how to interact with individuals. In high school, you begin to develop for the real world. You, you start thinking about a job, paying bills, living life. Uh, in college, you begin this path of adulthood but yet, over and over again in this entire process, you need guidance, you need individuals to help you get along. And there's so much information out there. I mean, on Twitter alone, every day, the amount of tweets that exist in one single day would fill a 10 million page book. It's a lot of characters. You're, you're bombarded with content. 
You're bombarded with information. People are telling you to do this, to not do that. Uh, in school, at home, in other places, friends, you name it. There is so much information out there. And yet, the purpose of this book, inspired by God, is to say, listen to this. You need this guidance. You need this wisdom. Uh, the, the Hebrew title for this book means preacher or teacher or someone that imparts wisdom. Uh, the Greek translation of that Hebrew title is what we see as Ecclesiastes, which means one who calls an assembly. This book is this individual, the preacher, gathering all of us. He's gathering all of us and he's saying, come and listen, I've lived a full life and I want to impart some wisdom. I want to give you some guidance. And we see that this preacher has lived a pretty eventful life. Verse 1, the words of the preacher, who is this? The son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, there are three kings that reigned in Jerusalem under the unified kingdom. Saul, David, and Solomon. Who is the preacher? Where if he is the son of David, this is a reference to Solomon. You have to understand that it is important to see who the mouthpiece is before you listen to the wisdom that they have to offer. What do I mean by this? There are certain individuals that I will get advice from depending on their expertise. Now, one time, I went on a trip with my wife. Uh, it, was, it was our year anniversary and we decided to go to Mes Mexico, uh, to this resort. Uh, and we decided to go with my brother and his wife. It, it was kind of like a, a double date type of trip. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a very fair-skinned individual, uh, so I need sunscreen. But nonetheless, while you're on vacation, you want to get some color, right? So though I probably need 50 SPF, I think, well, you know, I, I want to get, get some color. I want, I want people to realize that I've been on vacation. So I use SPF 30. Uh, lo and behold, day four of the trip, we head over to the beach and we're out of SPF 30. What to do? Well, we have SPF 15 and we have SPF 50. So my brother, being the genius that he is, he says, well, well, think about this. If you take 50, and you take 15, and you mix the two, and then you divide it by two, then it should average out about 30, right? And I thought, genius. <laughs> so you mix, you mix, you mix, you put it on you, you enjoy seven hours out in the sun, and then you get back to your room, and you look in the mirror, and you realize that you're a red and white zebra. Because the colors don't mix. They don't mix. So, so I had blotches of 50 and blotches of 15. Where there was 50, it was white. Where there was 15, it was red. And the rest of the time, it was trying to apply like the, the opposite of SPFs to try to balance out so I didn't look like a leper. <laughs> Will I go to my brother about any kind of scientific advice about SPF anymore? And of course not. Solomon, though, in talking about the meaning of life, I think he's gained some wisdom and some insight. Solomon is a unique individual in the history of the Bible. He was considered to be the, the wisest man outside of Christ. He was a rich man. He built the temple. He had a palace. He was the son of David, the second son of Bathsheba. And the Lord chose him to follow David to be the king in Israel. And he started out so strong. In the very beginning, he said, God, what I want is wisdom. And God granted it to him. So much so that, that when two gals bring a baby to him, and, and people say, what are you going to do? What does he say? Bring me my sword, and let's slice and dice this baby into two, and you can split it. And one of the ladies says, no, she can keep it. And he says, you're the mom. He had abnormal wisdom. But yet Solomon got caught up in the gift and forsook the giver. 
Now, 1 Kings 3.3 tells us that he didn't give himself completely over to the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1-6 to tells us that his many wives turned his heart away. This is a man who started strong and then departed from the Lord. And he's lived a long life. He is now old, and as an old man, the wisest, one of the most accomplished and wealthiest kings of Israel, discovers that life has absolutely no satisfaction in its riches, in its pleasures, in its joys, if God is not in the mix. The most powerful man feels powerless. He's unable to control all of life, and he goes on this spiritual odyssey to determine what is the meaning and the purpose of life. 2 Chronicles chapter 11, you don't have to turn there. It seems to confirm that after Solomon's wanderings, we can't say this with, for, for sure, with certainty, but it seems that it is confirmed that after his wanderings, he went back to the Lord. This man who has had everything, has seen everything, left the Lord and regained his trust in the Lord again, is the one who gathers you. And he says, I've lived life. I've seen it all. I've experienced so much. And I want to give you some guidance. I want to tell you what the purpose of life is. But because it's in the canon of Scripture, we know that it's not just Solomon's wisdom being imparted here. These words are God-breathed. God is using Solomon as a vessel to guide us in understanding the purpose of life. This book will deliver you from every other self-help book out there. This book will show you how to live a fixed life in a broken world. He wants you to realize that you need wisdom. That's the first step or the first tip of living a fixed life in a broken world. You need to realize that you need guidance. You can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own. And the Word of God will give us that guidance as we study this book of Ecclesiastes. The second tip of living a fixed life in a broken world is to realize the vanity of life. Look what verse 2 says. Solomon says, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The word that should stand out in that one verse is vanity. I mean, he uses this word 37 times in this 12-chapter book. He begins the book with it, and he closes the book with it. And in this one verse, in the Hebrew, there are eight words. And out of the eight Hebrew words, five of them are vanity. It's like me saying, I love books, 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 love books. There should be one word that stands out in that, and that's books. <laughs> I love the verb. Someone, someone's being funny. Uh, books. Someone said love from the crowd, FYI. You can engage. I can handle it. He says vanity. He says all is Vanity. What does this word vain mean? I mean, well, he uses similar phrases that are attached to this word vanity in the book of Ecclesiastes. He says things like striving after the wind. Have you ever tried to catch wind? If you have, you probably seek a little bit of help. This idea of trying to grasp something that you cannot. He, he says a phrase of no advantage uh, or another word, no Prophet. What he means by this is that life in itself without God has absolutely no profit. There's nothing to gain from it. It's like trying to grab wind. You will never actually obtain anything. One commentator says this, and this is a man with many letters behind his name. He says the best way to translate this is soap bubbles, all is soap bubbles. Beautiful, delightful, shimmering globes that last for literally seconds and then they disappear. That's what life is. Life is fleeting. It's passing away very quickly. It's profitless. It's fruitless. It's worthless. It's futile. It's transient and temporal without God in the mix. Out of the five times that he uses this word, 
Four of the times he combines the words together. Your English Bibles uh, attempt to do this. Look at this, vanity of vanities, right? And then he says again, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Out of the four, out of the five uses, four of the times he combines the two words together. And in the Hebrew, that's a strategy. When you combine two words together next to each other, you're emphasizing the greatness of that specific quality. Uh, the, the holy of holies, it's the holiest place. It's the two words put next to uh, together. And here Solomon doesn't just say that life is, is, is you know, futile and, and, and meaningless and without a purpose if, if God is not in it. He says it is utterly meaningless. There is literally no point to living if God is not in the equation. It's the highest degree of worthlessness. And look, he's all-inclusive in verse 2 at the very end. He says, all is vanity. All of it is pointless if there is no God. And you might see this and say, well, Solomon, you're just being Debbie Downer now. I mean, he's the kind of guy that sees the glass, you know, half empty. Maybe, maybe the Lord just dealt him a bad hand, and, and that's why he's talking this way. So if you begin to doubt Solomon, he's going to say, well, let me prove it to you. Let me prove it that this life is vain and pointless without God. And we get to our third tip. It's to realize the result of toil and work. He says, well, if you don't believe me, let me show you how vain this is by helping you realize what the result of toil and work is. Verse 3, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? What does is, what is an individual gain by all the work that they put in? It, it, it's a question with the expectation of what the answer will be. We know that work was, was a, a component of uh, Eden. Uh, Adam worked in the sense of naming the animals, and he was called to cultivate and subdue the land and all of the creation that the Lord had given him. But because of the fall, we read in Genesis 3.17 that now the earth is cursed and labor will now be in toil and in sorrow and there will not be a good result of it. You go to plant a vegetable garden and you get ten times more weeds than fruit. It's by the sweat of your face that you will work from the ground. The, war, the, the ground is cursed. Work is difficult. And the result is very minor. Solomon is talking about uh, work post-fall. Look what he says. He says, what does a man gain by all his toil at which he toils? And then there's this key word, under the sun. It's, it's east of Eden after the fall, but before the Lord returns. It's this in-between stage that's considered to be under the sun. He's giving you a catchy jingle so that you remember what the fallen state of the world is like. It's like saying ch 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 You know that. It's a catchy jingle. And he'll say under the sun multiple times to remind you of the depraved state that we are in after the fall happened and sin entered into the world. If you don't believe that there is no purpose for work in our common setting, like an ultimate purpose for work, I mean, work is good, remember, it's pre-fall, it existed pre-fall, but, but for you to find purpose in work, it, it's utterly meaningless. Why? Because why do you work? I mean, you're, I, know, I know you're millennials, so it's going to take you a while to probably work. I mean that. But not you. You're not typical millennials. You're out here on a Saturday. Let me encourage you, not discourage you. Why do you work? For money. What do you use money for? So that you can eat, sleep, rest, only to do what? More work. So that you can earn more money. So that you can eat, sleep, rest, and live somewhere in order for you to work even more. And it's this cycle. There is literally nothing to gain, he says. And gain means in the Hebrew, something that's left over. There is nothing left over. You will work, you will invest your life into a career, and at the end of the day, you will be put into the ground, and you can't take any of it with you. There is no ultimate purpose in work. There is no lasting value in 
work. This is so true of individuals. After the financial crisis happened in 2008, you were hit with countless stories of high-level executives in the financial world that took their own life. The acting chief financial officer of Freddie Mac took his own life. He hung himself in his basement. A French money manager who invested the wealth of many of his uh, Europe's royal individuals into Bernie Madoff's scheme, he, he slit his wrists and he died on his, in his Madison Avenue office. The Danish senior executive at, at uh, HSBC Bank, he, he hung himself after the financial crisis. When a Bernstein's executive learned that he would not be hired by J.P. Morgan Chase because the, the, the firm that uh, he was a part of was, was collapsing, he, he, uh, he, he overdosed on drugs. I mean, work is a good thing that has been given to us from God, but if you try to find your purpose and existence in it, it will leave you empty and hollow because it's vain. It's futile. It's passing away. There is no eternal purpose in it. He gives us a fourth tip. If you're not depressed enough, he gives us a fourth tip. He, he says, realize the momentary and monotonous nature of life. Realize the momentary and monotonous nature of life. Verse 4. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. I mean, Solomon is not saying that nature will never end. Solomon has a biblical view that the Lord will redeem all things. But when he says this idea that, that nature will not end, it's, a, it's an overstatement to get a point across. That while, look at this first half of verse 4, a generation goes and a generation comes, the earth and nature remains forever. The reality is, your life is very momentary. Your life is so momentary that nature will outlive you. Nature will outlive generations. You know, while I was in L.A., I went to, to the Master's Seminary, and while I was at Grace Community Church in, in Sun Valley, I had this opportunity to shepherd a Bible study of, of college students that met on the, the COC, College of the Canyons campus uh, in the northern L.A., Santa Clarita area. And we always went on this retreat uh, to this place called Camp Nelson. Uh, Camp Nelson was this neat little uh, cottage type of camp setting where we would have our retreats. And at Camp Nelson, there would be this hike that we would do on an annual basis. We would go to see the stag tree. Uh, the stag tree is considered to be the fifth largest tree in the world, and it's claimed to be over 2,000 years old. And you look at this massive tree and you think, 2,000 years. You think you're important? You think you're important? You think your life is long? You've been outlived by a tree! Generations have been outlived by a tree. And that's what Solomon is saying. It doesn't matter if you're Rockefeller, William Shakespeare, or Steve Jobs. It doesn't matter how important you are. A tree will outlive you. You should feel insignificant. That you're just one of millions upon millions. And the reality is that though you're one upon millions of millions, there's a tree that outlasts all of us. It's not only momentary, it's monotonous, this life. Look at verse 5. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. It's the same thing over and over and over again. It's a different day, but you're pretty much doing the same thing. You wake up, you brush your teeth, you shower, you eat some breakfast, you go to school, you go to work, you come home, you play a sport, you do another activity, you do something else, you go to sleep, you wake up, you brush your teeth, take a shower, eat some breakfast, go to school, go to work, come home, do something entertaining, 
rest, sleep, whatever it is, and it's a different day, but you are literally doing the same thing over and over again. He says the sun is in constant motion. The verb that he uses there is it hurries, it pants, it's running this race, but it never comes to a finish line. I mean, you will wake up and do the same thing 365 times a year, and if you live 80 years, that's 30,000 times of the same thing in a different version. It's monotonous. There is some variety, but it's the same endless cycle he continues this idea in verse six the wind blows to the south and it goes around to the north around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns the the wind never has an ending destination it is this cycle that goes round and round verse seven all streams run to the sea but the sea is not full to the place where the streams flow there they flow again the streams they flow down but the sea never comes to a full capacity. It is this endless cycle in nature that shows us that our life is also this monotonous cycle. But the difference is, it ends. It's momentary and it's monotonous. There is no goal. There is no finish line. There is no fulfillment. And nature is climbing an endless set of stairs. And it's on this merry-go-round that will not stop. And it will not go anywhere. And, and you are on that merry-go-round as well. You have a momentary life that is monotonous. And it has absolutely no purpose to it without God in the mix. Fifth tip that Solomon gives us to live a fixed life in a broken world is to realize the lack of satisfaction this life brings. Is to realize the lack of satisfaction that this life brings. Verse 8. He says, All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. Humans that are confronted by the monotony and aimless cycle of life, they say we cannot utter it. It is weary you'll realize soon enough that nothing in this life will satisfy whether it's you being 17 when i when i realize that you know what everything that this world has to offer does not fill this void that is in the middle of my chest nothing can satisfy me realizing that i needed the lord or whether it's your your midlife crisis where you go out and you buy a convertible sports car to, to bring some kind of satisfaction or fulfillment to your life, whatever moment in your life it is, there will come a moment when you realize that nothing can satisfy you. Second half of verse 8, the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. There's nothing that you can see. There's nothing that you can hear that will bring you satisfaction. And you say, is this true? Listen to the guy who's telling you this. Not me. Solomon. I mean, what did, Solomon, did he have intellect? Yes. Did he have property? Yes. Did he have power? Yes. Did he have influence? Yes. Fame, wealth, travel, relationships, you name it, pleasure. Solomon had it. At the end of his life, he sits back and he looks at all of it and he says, none of it satisfies. You name it, it will not bring you ultimate joy. Verse 9. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. You might say, well, there are many new things. I mean, you should see my new Apple Watch. You should see the new iPhone that came out. There's been this invention called fidget spinners. It's pretty new. What Solomon is saying here is not that There are no new creations. There are no new creations that bring ultimate fulfillment and satisfaction for your life. You can enjoy all the new tech. You can enjoy all the new inventions. You can enjoy the new careers that are created, but none of those things, Solomon says, 
will ever bring you lasting joy. Gives us a sixth tip. Tells us that in order for us to live a fixed life in a broken world, we need to realize the insignificant impact a life makes. The insignificant impact a life makes. Read with me verse 11. There is no remembrance of the former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Solomon is saying you won't remember the people that have come before you, and when you go, the coming generations won't remember you. We all want to be remembered. We all want to be unique. Uh, This is true. Because I read an article a while back about the the most outrageous names that certain parents have given their kids in order for their kids to be unique. And I, you know, I I I, I, I've always kind of disliked my name growing up in Sacramento, Vlad. You know, it's it's different. People would say, "Don't get mad, get Vlad," and a variety of different things. Kids are cruel. But then when I read this article, I realized that Vlad is one that I'll take. I eight little boys. I think this was like 2006 when I read this. They were named Awesome. There are eight little boys out there in the world where their name is Awesome. Uh, Fifteen of each of these names, Honest and Holy. There are individuals out there that can say, I'm Honest, my name is Honest, or my name is Holy. There are six boys who are named Handsome. It's foreseeing the possible future. Some kids, 12 boys, have been called or named Boss. Five girls in 2016 were named Eliminate. 22 baby boys named Halo. Most likely not the thing over your head, but the game. I believe how these wives let these men do this. People want to be unique. They want to be remembered. And Solomon says that life goes on. You're put into the ground. And guess what? People forget you. I mean, let me mention a name to you. and Let me see if any of you know this name. Kofu. Not, not tofu, Kofu. It's good, good question, good clarifying question. Kofu. You don't know that name. You know it now. Yeah, I'm bringing it to light. It was the second pharaoh of the fourth dynasty. And when he died, his highest official built for him the largest pyramid in Egypt that became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It consists of 2.3 million blocks. It's considered to be 150 yards tall. And 250 yards wide. Literally, you could have the largest pyramid built for your name and no one will remember your name. You will go to Egypt and you'll say, cool pyramid. But you will not remember Kofu. Because that's the reality that Solomon is enunciating here in verse 11. There is no remembrance of the former things, nor will you be remembered as the generations go on your family might remember you for a few years after you're gone they'll stop visiting that gravesite they'll move on you'll be a distant memory a few pictures that they'll show you after generation generation you will just disappear into the history of existence and i know what you're thinking what a great way to begin a saturday morning What in the world is this guy doing? I give up. What is the point? And that is the point. Solomon wants you to come to the natural conclusion that without God in the picture, it is all literally pointless. But guess what? God is in the picture. He does exist. And because He does exist, There can be purpose and meaning to life. You can live a fixed life in a very broken 
world. And that is the seventh and most key important detail that unlocks the meaning of life. And that key is to realize the key to meaningful life. Realize the key to meaningful life. Solomon doesn't say the way that you fix your life is by addressing all of these horizontal things. Oh, I just got to get a job that really brings me purpose. Oh, I have to really do great things so that I'm remembered. Oh, I have to do this and that and that in order for the horizontal to be solved. All of these issues that he's been talking about. He doesn't resolve the predicament that we're in by looking horizontally. He resolves it by looking vertically. Ecclesiastes is meant to be read in one sitting. Ecclesiastes is meant to be read in one sitting. And the conclusion of Ecclesiastes brings the whole meaning of this book into perspective. And I want you to turn there. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. The conclusion of this book that tells us what then is the key to meaningful life in order for it not to be vain. He says, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole or full duty of man. It is not an abstract thought, this idea of fearing God. It's having a healthy, reverent understanding of who God is and that you were created to live for His glory. What does it mean to fear the Lord? The best way to understand fearing the Lord is realizing that you were created for His glory. You were created for the sole purpose of exalting and making much of His name to enjoy Him forever. And the reality is we have all fallen short Of that. We have all sinned and we have all rebelled against this perfect and holy God, and we are under His divine and perfect and just wrath. He has to judge every action, and He will in the end. Therefore, there has to be this healthy fear of, I am under God's judgment, that there is none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they've become useless. There's none who does good. There's not even one. Romans 1.18 tells us, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We have exchanged God for other futile things and because of that, we will be judged. But there's good news. But that good news cannot be understood until you realize that you are under that judgment from birth. I've heard it said that you don't need to perish, you don't, you don't need to, you don't need a parachute to skydive, but you need a parachute to skydive twice. I appreciate that quote. I appreciate that quote because I've gone skydiving. A week before I was to get married, I had my friends take me out to go skydiving. That was my way of determining the Lord's will, whether or not she was the one. I'm joking, it wasn't. I didn't even know about it. But when you jump out of a plane and you're flying, you realize the importance of that chute opening up. And when you realize a healthy, reverent fear that you are under the judgment of God because you have rebelled against Him and you have not made Him to be glorious as He is, you realize that you need 
hope. And that hope is the God-man, Jesus Christ. The second person of the Trinity that came veiled in flesh and He lived a perfect life. And He went to that cross to endure the judgment that you and I deserved. The Father pouring out His perfect judgment on the Son so that you and I might be saved. And He was raised on the third day to vindicate and validate that the sacrifice was accepted. So that when you and I turn to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our sins are forgiven and His perfect righteousness is credited to our account. That is the first step in fearing the Lord. is realizing you're under His judgment, but then looking to the Gospel, the good news of salvation that He offers. He made Him who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That is the beginning of fearing the Lord. When you turn to Jesus Christ, you realize that you are His. That you are created to make much of Him. That this entire existence, the, the monotony, the, the momentary, the 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 redundant reality of this existence, everything that you do, whether it's work, raising a family, having recreation, whatever it is, all of it exists to make much of His name. And when you think that way, there is purpose in all of it. Solomon says, what do you get in this life, in this broken world, that makes it all worthwhile? You get God. You get God and you enjoy Him. Not only now and find purpose in all that you do, you enjoy Him forever. It means trusting Him. Delighting in His Word. Delighting in keeping His commandments. Hating evil. And enjoying the loyal love that only He can offer. And when you have that perspective... All of it has meaning. You enjoy your relationships. You enjoy your work. You enjoy your recreation. You even enjoy, as we'll talk about in our next session, the most deepest pains that we can experience in this life. Because we look to Him who can satisfy our soul. Guys, gals, you can spend your entire life thinking about what is the one thing that I can remove from the fire? What is the one thing that I need to fix in order for me to enjoy this broken life a little more? And you might think it's relationships, money, fame, whatever your fill-in-the-blank is. Why fix one thing when you can fix the whole thing and enjoy it? by looking to Christ as your Lord and Savior and fearing Him and obeying Him and living to worship Him. My question to you as we close is, what's keeping you from living a fixed life in a broken world? And the answer to that question is, not looking to Christ. So if you are the Lord's, realize that this description that Solomon has made, you can find joy in all of it because you know the One who brings you joy. But if you're not the Lord's, then you need to realize that this life is vain. And you can find fulfillment, pleasure, and joy in it by looking to Christ this morning. Pray with me. Father, We thank You that You remind us that nothing in this world can satisfy. And all of it is just a shadow of the substance. The little joys that we get to have, whether it's food, pleasure, family, recreation, is all just a glimpse of the satisfaction that we can only have in knowing Christ. Make much of Christ this morning as we treasure Him with our heart and we learn to find purpose in life by fearing You and looking to Christ. We pray all this in His precious name. Amen.